My pranams. My name is Rishi Nitya Pragya, and I have recently written this book, Celebrating Life, which is published by Penguin International. I feel the nature, the Brahman, the universe, has bestowed such limitless powers, infinite siddhis, in human consciousness, along with being successful in our relationships and professional fields. Exploring this infinite potential within also is the purpose of human birth. It's a very scientific, very technical process of unfolding these layers and layers of Siddhis within us. And that technical process is the theme of celebrating life. I feel every individual soul is potentially divine. Uncovering that divinity within is the purpose of human birth. And that's the theme of this book. That's why we have written Celebrating Life, Six Steps to Complete Blossoming of Your Individual Consciousness. Please enjoy. Lots of love and pranams. Welcome back to Studio One. We begin this session, Gurus, Heroes and Villains, with our respected panel of speakers. Our first speaker for today is Manvina Sanduma. She's based in Toronto, Canada. She has been closely following the Bhagwan Rajneesh movement for the past 25 years. And her book, Nothing is a result of the interest and much views and she in addition to being a writer she works as an addictions counselor in canada our second speaker is fazil al khazi sir he's a renowned theater director founder of the ruchika theater group he has also written his father ibrahim al khazi's memoirs to be published in december and the stage the al khazi padamsi family memoir fazil's warm witty and intimate anecdotes make it an unput and downable story as well. He participates in dramatized readings and discussions on contemporary theater. Our moderator for this session is Ms. Tapa Basu. She is a best-selling author, a poet, author, publisher, professional, and her short stories have appeared in various anthologies like Crossed and Knotted, Defiant Dreams, When They Spoke, and write India stories. Her latest book, The Curse of Nadir Shah, won the Best Fiction Award at Author Awards. Her debut, a psychological thriller, Dangle, was nominated for the PILF Anubam Kher Award for debut novels in, tw in 2017. And now request Sutapa Basu ma'am to take the session forward. Thank you, Dheeraj. I welcome you all to this session of PILF 2020 entitled Gurus, Villains and Heroes. Hi, Faisal. Faisal al -Kazi is the author of not yet released, but much awaited Enter Stage Right Memoirs of the Badamsi and al -Kazi family. Hi, Manbina. Hello. Manbina Sandhu has authored Nothing to Lose, a biography of Ma Anand Sheila, whose life story has intrigued the world. And I'm Shutupa Basu. I'm an author, poet, and I write also historical biographies. Some of them are Padmavati, The Legend of Genghis Khan, and The Curse of Nadesha. 
Now, we have all been brought together because we have written biographies. Though, and what is a biography? A biography is actually telling history in a very special way. But the difference is here, it is usually based on the events of one person's life. Now, biographies can be academic, where the author is very strict about facts and dates. They can be entertaining, where there's a mixture of facts and fiction, and they can be motivational. I think Manbina's is motivational as well. <laughs> So okay. these, so these are the yeah. So these are the different kinds of biographies, and we have been brought under this uh, very intriguing title, uh, gurus, villains, and heroes. Now I wonder, is it because our protagonists or our protagonist is a little bit of each? You know, a bit of hero, a bit of a villain, and a bit of a guru. While my protagonists can be called that because both Nadesha and Genghis Khan, there were strategies are still being studied in military archives. They have been vilified for their bloody massacres. And yet, large masses of people all over the world, even today, venerate them. So what about your protagonists and our protagonist? Are there also bit hero, bit William, and bit guru? Faisal, shall we go with you first? That's a great one to ask, Sutapa. Uh, I think because... Uh, it's tough because it's about my father. So to use the word villain is a very tough one. I don't think he fits the bill I'm at sure all. He wasn't. <laughs> uh, certainly, certainly guru. I think that's a wonderful word to use for him. And he's known as theater guru by so many people uh, in the theater and cinema world in that kind of way. And hero, of course, to many, many people, the hero. But I think to the child of anyone, uh, the parent is very rarely the hero. You know what I mean? Uh, we see them in the parents, so we see all the other dimensions of the person. We don't only really see them in relation to their work or their achievements. We see them in other very emotional, perhaps, kind of terms. Uh, so I'm happy with the hero and I'm happy with the guru. I will definitely discard the villain. <laughs> okay. Manbina, what about you? Um, as for me, uh, my belief is that every human being on earth has shades of goodness and malice. We all have those, um, uh, you know, dark and light shades. We're all made of these, uh, you know, we all have lust, anger, greed, attachment, ego to some degree in uh, in each form. So um, uh, when I see as for myself and everybody else out there, uh, I believe my protagonist is no exception. And uh, she has these different shades to her personality and different roles come out at different points. Right. If you see the documentary Wild Wild Country, there are a lot of people who do have things to say which are not very, uh, you know, very good about her. So, uh, well, yeah, you can you know, say. Yeah, yeah, there are things that as for, um, you know, when you talk of a guru, yes, I can say I see a lot of guru in her and that right. I can talk out of my own personal experience from the time that I've known her. Um, as we see her now, her actions speak louder than her words. And uh, of course, though her words are very potent. And um, keeping in mind the time that I spent with her in Switzerland, um, I saw her taking care of her patients so tenderly and she did everything so efficiently and everything was so meticulously around, uh, arranged in her care home that I could glimpse the Sheila of the yesteryears who had right. at one point uh, built the Red City and, and had run it. So her Absolutely. inner strength stays the same. And um, there's a lot we can learn from her life and she imparts wisdom uh, very casually as she goes about her day if we have the eyes to see and the heart to feel. So, so yes, I see a lot of guru in her. Uh, and as for the villain, I would say that uh, a lot depends on the eye of the beholder. You know, um, that, uh, um, you know, life sometimes puts us in situations where we are forced to make those moves uh, that we normally wouldn't. It is the pressure of the situation, the circumstance that we enter, uh, we tend to make those moves that fall in the gray area and we cannot necessarily categorize them or uh, as right or wrong. And I believe that Marshila was put in that spot several times as a Bhagwan secretary where she had to make those moves that couldn't be categorized as a right or wrong or a black or white. A lot of them fell in the gray area. So um, uh, it also depends upon the 
perception of the person who's viewing her if you want to uh, label her as a villain it, uh, i think a lot depends upon your own perception as well and here you know she certainly is because uh, you know she fended for her uh, bhagwan and stood by his side and built a castle and stood on the gates of it and she did not care about anybody's opinion and did what she had to do uh, to serve her master so uh, yeah she's heroic in every term so she has a bit of everything uh, you know different shades to her personalities is what i believe great you just spoke about perceptions now a family memoir is a little different from the normal biographies because their perceptions is what actually rules it usually it is a narration which is based on the author's personal memories and it's more it's uh, more uh, of more than a literary or an art document it is act it, it's something like that is rather than a personal legacy it's also the story of the author's heritage that he would have inherited from uh, the past generations of his family and to this extent the author's voice resonates in a memoir maybe more than the protagonists in it also there's another i think something strange that happens when a person starts recalling all the events that happened in the past he or she might stumble upon something that has had a great influence on his own life and in that regard i would like to put to you faisal in your mem in your memoir you mentioned about your mother roshan padamsi who did a strip tease dance when she was just 19 for her brother sultan padamsi's play on stage like her you have also gone there where others fear to tread your group ruchika is known for its radical plays that have created a lot of uproar can you recall an incident when you refused to toe the line and what were its consequences <laughs> i wish there was one incident sutapa there's so many <laughs> i'm sure there are many <laughs> yes <laughs> you know what i mean so uh, i think i should just talk about maybe two of them uh i think two days after the emergency was declared we back right, you yeah. know what it is yeah <laughs> so we were rehearsing we were rehearsing a play uh, at that time by an author from uh, poland uh, shlawomir mrojek called striptease and mm -hmm. we did that to uh, hindi and we had mm -hmm. alok who used to act with me forever now of course vilified by me too in a great way and uh, sanjeev bhargav is the protagonist and mm -hmm. two days before we were opening this play uh, the emergency was declared so we went ahead with our shows as we've always done and uh, the play is so interesting it's two men pushed into a room uh, you don't know by whom and they're not allowed to leave at all and from the setting only a woman's hand emerges a bit too much like the congress symbol of that time and starts <laughs> giving them instructions of what to do so okay. first they put to their underwear then they get handcuffed together then dance caps are put on to their head and all the time they say we are free we are free it's wonderful it's kind of an intellectual exercise by them that how free they are and how many things they can actually do when actually there's none of this possible for them at all so i think that play within the second show of it and the police had come in and said well you're not allowed to do any more shows of this and i remember a similar thing in 1980 when we were doing the so first did you stop? so did you stop uh, the play we stopped doing the shows but i would share another incident a uh, little bit later uh, a colleague of mine in the group was doing this play about the assassination of uh, bhutto zulfikar ali bhutto and amazingly the day we were opening premiering the play in delhi uh, it was the play the lead was being played by rajesh khattar Who's Ishan Khattar's father? Ishan is now so famous because of his lead in *The Suitable Boy*. And yes. uh, just the day before the show, the government announced that Zia Ul Haq was coming to Delhi, and Zia Ul Haq is the complete villain of the piece because he Thank was so much behind Zulfikar's uh, assassination. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided to go ahead with the shows. And then the De Delhi government just didn't know what to do. They had their own spies in the theater where we were performing. and they tipped off the police the police refused to give us permission uh, not on the grounds of the script but just on the grounds of some particular paper from the entertainment tax commissioner had not come in time so we moved the court 
Uh, Mukul was the judge at that time, Mukul Rotagi, who was, of course, very uh, major in Indian judiciary. And uh, he said he was in class with us. So he knew us all very well from school days. And he said, just present the script. So on the morning of the dress rehearsal, we presented the script. He just flipped through. He said, no chance. Don't even try. I'm telling you as a friend and as the person in charge, you can't do it. So we were waiting, of course, for this court order, which would come the following day or later the same day. So me and my colleague, Arun, who directed the play, we decided to go ahead, uh, Sutapa, with the dress rehearsal. And okay. Shiram Sinha immediately knew they locked the door. They said, you can't get in anybody. He said, wo court ka paper abhi tak nahi aya. Paisla nahi pata. Paisla to hume achhi tarah pata tha kya hua hai. So we got the whole press in from the back staircase. They all okay. said, you know, Ruchika theater group members. Uh, they didn't come into the auditorium. They watched the whole play from the wings. And of course, by the evening, the paper came. And then this auditorium said, we can't have you here at all. We got out of there. But in its wisdom, Modern School gave us the auditorium and we actually ran a show of the play. It was not a ticketed show. It was invited for people. But certainly there have been many run-ins. I'm just giving you two, but there have been many run-ins. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, even last year, I did this beautiful William Inge's film, Splendor in the Grass on stage. And it's a play about the very young sexual awakening of young people in their school years. And I set it in small town India. I didn't set it in Delhi because Delhi, this is like all uh, passe and it's all happened so long ago. And people came up after the show and said, it's so sexually explicit. And this is Jabalpur mein kabhi nahi hota. I was wondering which world they were living in. So very often audiences tend to be very conservative and we have to be very cautious as theater directors um, and just do what we feel is correct. And uh, is appropriate. I did a play, for instance, on this China's uh, one child policy, you know, which was there for 35 years. <laughs> I know, now, yeah. So I did a play called The Dark Road based, uh, based on the on a novel by a dissident writer. Uh, and we did the play at India International Center because very often my very offbeat ones go on at IIC. And I don't think IIC was very happy hosting a play on this very draconian policy of the Chinese, which was news everywhere. But uh, they were not happy having the situation shown on stage of these family planning officials. And actually what they used to do in China is they used to inject uh, distemper into the woman's uterus and abort the child. And then you were not allowed to even uh, cremate the child or bury the child. They would not give you the fetus at all. So it's a very it's a very disturbing play because the whole mm -hmm. play is about family planning refugees. You know what I mean? Running mm -hmm. away from the war. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in, in uh, China for 35 years, it's been repealed only uh, much more recently in 15, 2015. From 80 to 2015, each family could only have one child. And as in India, they were choosing mm -hmm. the boy. Mm -hmm. so the whole oh. generation with much, with millions of less women than men. Yeah. So I'm radical. Continue to be the new one we are rehearsing, which is shut down with lockdown, but we'll open it once we're through. Is set in a brothel in Chhattisgarh, okay. uh, okay. which is presented by all sides of the conflict because all men are driven by certain parts of their anatomy. Mm -hmm. And it's an adaptation of an American play. Uh, so I've got my back covered. It's Lynn Nottage's uh, play which uh, I've uh, called Ruined. We're doing it in Hindi called Barbad, but it's fitting. India, Chhattisgarh, brothel. Oh, ah, yeah, you know, absolutely. Nice area. It's also with the police on one side, it's the Adivasi on the other side. So let's see what people have to say. We are, we are ready for it. <laughs> and we are waiting for it. We are waiting of for course, it. Of course, of course. <laughs> we are already waiting for it. Abhi kya <laughs> Yeah. So just like Faisal's voice comes across so strongly in his uh, plays and in uh, his decisions that he takes about theater. So, uh, you know, when uh, you when I was writing my historical biographies, uh, they were see all these people are historical figures whose stories are already archived. So mm -hmm. I had to do it from a certain point of narration. And therefore, mm -hmm. again, here instead, you know, mostly biographies, what happens is the person who's writing the biography subdues mm -hmm. his or her voice. So that mm -hmm. the voice of the person who's being biographed comes across. But in mm -hmm. my biographies, it is my POV, which is coming across very, very strongly because it's my point of narration as far as that historical figure is concerned. Now, Mandina, my next question goes to you. Though 
you have written about Ma Anandchila, and she is very, very prominent and dominant in the book. There is, there are certain places where somewhere I feel your voices come through. So let me quote: The master had lost his way, and now where would the disciple go? This is yeah. from your book, and yeah. I feel that your voice. So could you elaborate on that statement? Uh -huh. No, I wouldn't say it was my voice. It was uh, in reference to uh, the point where Marshila finds herself in jail after all that she had done for her beloved Bhagwan. So this was mm -hmm. in reference to that point. Uh, okay. so you, you see, the ones who are, those who have read my biography know that Marshila fell in love with Bhagwan at a very tender age of sixteen, and from that point on, she lost herself. Young in, age. Bhagwan, yeah, and she dedicated her life to him. She she sacrificed her all for him, and she followed him everywhere he went. And in fact, uh, fended for him and uh, did all she could in her power. But then at, there came a time um, when she saw her own Bhagwan, um, you know, dwindling on the edge of his own ideologies and uh, his own uh, philosophies and. Uh, maybe due to the glare of the glitter or the, uh, you know, the the stupor of the nectar or whatever the reason may be that he was dwindling on his own philosophy as Ma, Ma Sheila believed. And that is the point she decided to turn her back on him and she walked out on him. And uh, uh, that, that, but that was, by then it was too late. Um, it wasn't long before she found herself in jail and uh, because of all that she did for her master so that quote was in reference to this this incident okay okay yeah so still you see she came into bhagwan's influence and she felt that he was her mentor and that is why she went along and i mean she has done tremendous work for him as well yeah, yeah. so sometimes these larger than life figures also have mentors you know, in my book, in Genghis Khan, uh, Genghis Khan's um, uh, mentor was actually his mother, Holin, and his wife, Borja. They are mm. the ones who inspired him to create the Mongolian Empire. In a mm. similar way, uh, Nadir Shah, his role model was Timur. Mm -hmm. So much so that he decided to bring his bloodline into his family by marrying his son to mm. Aurangzeb's granddaughter. Mm -hmm. Now, in this respect, Fezal, your father has founded the National School of Drama and you have carried forward his contribution to theatre. Mm. Your memoirs suggest that the real catalyst of this chemistry of both you and your father with the world of theatre and stage actually came from Sultan Padamsi's love for theatre. Mm -hmm. So do you tell me if this, this congruence with the stage and this extensive Al-Qazi um, beneficence would it have taken place if your father had not met Sultan Padamsi? I think it's a great question. It's that million dollar question with we never know how to answer. <laughs> Let me put it like that. Yeah. But I think uh, sometimes it's a kind of uh, way that people come together, Sutapa, uh, over yes. many years. And I think it was a moment in Indian history just before independence where many artists were looking for what is the way forward? What mm -hmm. are they going to whether in painting or in sculpture. And we know so many people from Ram Kinkar Bej to so yes. many people in the Ipta mm -hmm. movement, you know, who are asking the same kind of questions. Mm -hmm. So the question, I think, is very much uh, relevant because my father at that time was in St. Xavier's school. My uncle, Sultan Padamsi, had had to come back directly from Oxford. He was too young for Oxford. So actually, when he went to England, he had to hang around for a year in a school where he'd already finished his senior Cambridge, but because he was a of, genius, yeah. I, mean, he was a genius I think, from what you were talking about. He was a genius in, in many aspects, wonderful painter, a great poet, and of course, very major in the theater scene as well. And academically, very, very gifted, you know, in 1938, uh, 39, for a 15 year old boy to get into Oxford was a very, very big achievement. Absolutely, yes. So, what he did was, uh, he was very keen to do the kind of stuff that he did, and luckily, he had around him a group of kind of, should one say, almost uh, blind followers, kind of. He was very charismatic as a person. And uh, he was back uh, in India. He was at Xavier's and studying there, a big change from being in Oxford. And then uh, as a second play at Xavier's, I'd love to share with you because I've not done it in detail in the book. Uh, he did Othello, but he did it backwards. So he took okay. Shakespeare's Othello and he started with the murder of Desdemona. 
that was the opening scene of the play was Othello murdering Desdemona and then it was all as a flashback the story okay. came as a flashback that's and really different this was in 1942 people Imagine. in Bombay were hunted Shakespeare ke ye kar diya. you know what I mean <laughs> I know now we've got used to it with I think with Vishal's films and with so many yes. other things we've got yes. used to the idea of that we can do so many things with Shakespeare and play around with the themes play around with the gender of the protagonists I've seen Taming of the Shoe with the switch cast with women playing the men and men playing the women but that's now and then in 43 when he chose to do Oscar Wilde's Salome which was the play uh, that he chose to do the college said definitely not get out get out of this college and do whatever you want outside in Bombay so you had to look for a theater space there were many but there were those huge huge British auditoriums that were there which had been populated by the Parsi theater companies so he chose a marriage destination this Kausi Jahangir Hall which is now NGMA Bombay you know that brown okay. kind of church and did the play <laughs> and of course with him went all the people from uh, St. Xavier's College and among them my father. My father was all of 18 mm -hmm. and uh, my father was inducted into this huge very westernized uh, Padamsi family and you know uh, my uncle of course is Alec who passed away a couple of years ago again a very big uh, theatre director in his own right and uh, so from there everybody in that family uh, was a part of it uh, Sultan himself committed suicide soon after, just before independence. And three sisters of the family, my mother Roshan and her two sisters Zarina and Shiraz, also married people from the theatre group. So the theatre group was very much a family enterprise. And I think if my father had not met them, I'm not sure he would have gone into theatre because he was actually, Sutapa, very keen on painting. Yes, yes, I know. There's so much about him. And when he went to England, he actually went to study art. And then the course that he was doing was so miserable that he was just pa walking past uh, Radha, Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. And he said, let's try this because I've acted so much in Bombay. And he walked in and they heard his voice and what he'd done. And in, in India, they immediately gave him a scholarship and said that you're on. But even at Radha, he found the course very wanting. Uh, because it was dated. Anybody who teaches in a drama school tends to be 10 years uh, before everything. And theatre changed so much in England and in Europe during World War II. So he got into a big course of self-study. And I think the wonderful part was, uh, Sutapa, that when he was there in England, literally his bed mate, they slept in the same double bed, was Nisim Ezekiel, the big mm -hmm. Indian okay. poet. And yeah. Uh, yeah, the great friend staying with them was uh, Francis Newton Souza. So you can imagine these three Indians, one an artist, one a poet, one a theater person, and my mother was there as a costume designer. Uh, they were so immersed in what was happening and the churn in the arts after World War II. So uh, they were looking at all cutting edge stuff. You know, they were perhaps not, he was not learning it at Radha, but he was seeing the new productions. He was seeing what was happening on the stage. He was very interested in what was happening in art, and already at that time, Picasso, Braque, all these people were old hat. You know what I mean? They were like 20 years old. Yeah, so it was, so it was like a new world. life. Uh, yeah, so he was actually bringing in a new trend, a new life into the entire Absolutely. performing as well as in, into the art. Uh, yeah. Wow. So they were able to enter that entire world. And then think when we're going back to India, because that's where we feel we want to work, at least Nisim and my father and mother, uh, what do we do? What is the way forward? And on the ship, it's so interesting. He worked in English theatre in Bombay. He wrote a letter to Nisim on the ship saying how essential it would be to learn Hindi and start working in Hindi. Because he was a small town boy. My father grew up in Pune, where yes. this international literary festival is. Yes. So <laughs> but lovely to hear how, uh, you know, but he has done both. He has put his fingers into painting as well as art, as well as theatre. Equally, I mean, yeah. you know, brought yeah. in some really sort of handed us heritages, in fact, in both these uh, fields. And photography and photography. And photography. And photography. Absolutely. Absolutely. Photography. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So sometimes biographies also leave very intriguing questions, you know, for the reader. Like uh, when I was writing Genghis Khan, I discovered that there was a mystery about his death. Nobody knows when he died, how he died and where his grave is. 
Even now, uh, researchers and archaeologists are still searching for his grave. And in my book, I have left that you know, question open-ended. Similarly, I think, Manmina, you have done a similar thing. You've had, you've been researching for, you know, more than two decades about yeah. the auto movement. You yeah. have had so many conversations with uh, Ma Anand Sheila and she has authorized your biography. But you have left the answer of a certain very intriguing question open. Yeah. Let me ask you that question now. And I mm -hmm. hope you will answer from your gut feeling. Was Bhagwan Rajneesh actually murdered by his doctor Devraj? See, if you ask me of my personal opinion, it does not really matter because it is all guesswork and speculation. Because, uh, yeah, because when I wrote uh, the biography, as Marshila narrated, uh, she told me everything off from her own memory as she remembers uh, things. And uh, it is so difficult to remember everything absolutely as it was. So, uh, you know, it was her, 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 her story that she and I wrote down whatever I, I felt that she was, um, you know, so when the reader comes across, reads it, it is as it is, as it came from her to me. And uh, but there is an he, insinuation that they, yeah. that is there. Yeah. You will yeah. Agree. yeah. <laughs> So uh, as per Ma Sheila, uh, she believes that Bhagwan did not uh, die of natural causes. And she believes that because uh, she is so deeply, her uh, belief is that she's so deeply connected uh, with Bhagwan Rajneesh that if he had died of natural causes, she would have felt something. But because she oh. did not feel anything, she did, She feels that uh, it is her intuition that she believed that he did not die of natural causes. But now who killed Bhagwan is, not something that concerns her, uh, be it the doctor, be it anybody from the management, be it any random person, that is none of her concerns as to who killed Bhagwan. And uh, let's keep in mind that this question of who killed Bhagwan is one of those questions that will go down in history as a mystery that will never be solved, you know? So, uh, and um, I think uh, uh, we should leave it as it is and make peace with it, uh, that there are still questions that will never be answered. Yeah. So you prefer keeping it a mystery? It okay. will be a mystery. Maybe a new Netflix series on the unsolved yes. mystery. Yes. Wouldn't be a bad possibly. idea. Yes, yeah. possibly. We can look forward to a new Netflix for the monitor. Right, yes, right. Yes, yes, yes. right. Faisal, you have written two, bi two biographical plays as well. Uh, Noor, which is about Noor Jahan. And you have also written A Quiet Desire. Uh, now, Quiet Desire... Uh, it explores the relationship between Tagore and his sister-in-law, Kadambari, which mm -hmm. has had its fair share of controversies. Mm -hmm. Now, did you visualize Kadambari as Tagore's muse? Mm -hmm. And what about the muses in your life? Tell us about oh, them as well. <laughs> uh, wonderful question. Yeah. So I think um, uh, increasingly when I started reading Tagore, and you know, for most of us as uh, Indians who don't know uh, Bangla, uh, we read in translation and uh, of course we read it in school and then we grumble because we all know where the line mind is without fear and so many poems that i landed up doing as elocution pieces uh, for modern school when i was there uh, in the 60s and the 70s and then much later in my life perhaps uh, not much later really 10 years later in my 80s uh, william radice who was at that time the poet laureate of england uh, he was working with me. We done. We were writing a production together on Krishna, which I was going to do here in Delhi, and I did. Uh, so uh, William was writing uh, the lyrics for the songs that Paramveer was going to set uh, to music, and he had just come up with the new translations of Tagore, uh, which I know by themselves are controversial. But how William has translated them, and I just fell in love with the kind of poetry there, and I said, "Who is this woman?" who is invisible and recurs constantly in Tagore's writing. And then when I started looking at the paintings, which, you know, Tagore only started painting when he was well into his 60s, uh, I saw it was the same woman, the same eyes in all the paintings uh, recurrently there. And then I remember reading uh, perhaps by somebody from Shantini Ketan that it's always the melancholy eyes of Kardambari. And then I started reading Krishna Kripalani's uh, biography of Tagore, beautifully written uh, biography, I must say, of Tagore. And uh, here I said, it's the same person. 
So it's this woman who's there in the paintings. It's a woman who's often there in these triangular relationships that form, in a way, a crux of a lot of Tagore's writing. So there's always a husband and wife, and there is another man. Now, we all know the film Charulata based on Nashtanir. And we also know Ghare Bairi, where, again, it's a triangular relationship. And many of the stories follow this kind of a theme. So I tried to read more. And then I found forming in my mind from the poetry and from uh, the prose, certainly not from the plays, but certainly from the prose, I was getting these images of these three characters, uh, Kadambri herself marrying into this Tagore household, which, you know, in the Tagore household, every day at Jora Shako, 102 people sat down for lunch. It was such a big, uh, sprawling joint family and so many hangers on because they were wealthy. Uh, and then there was this young boy uh, who was the 14th child of his mother and therefore not very close, despite what other people have written later. My belief is that Ravindranath was not very close and not really looked at a lot. Children were not to be the focus of parental attention at that point of time, as we are obsessed with our children today. <laughs> and this young girl comes in. She's a year older than him. She's 11. The brother that she's married is 10 years older. He's in his 20s. And he's already a man of the world, you know, already he's out and about Jyotirindranath, he's renowned. There are many stories of how he himself is involved with Binodhani, the actress of the day. Uh, that's kind of, you know, a legend in Calcutta. Whether it's true or not, we'll never know. So I found that what was happening between these two young kids, very impressionable years, 11, 12, 13. And, you know, by the time he was 15, uh, he was published. Uh, he had done that beautiful book, uh, making, uh, imitating the style of a 16th century poet. And everybody believed it was true. And then they found it's a fake and actually <laughs> Roby's written it. So he was, very well yeah. known, that's yeah. right. he was very well known by 15 or 16. And uh, who, ha who was his constant companion? And then I looked at those years through various biographies of him. Uh, and he was always staying with these two. So they were on this houseboat, often on the Padma. They had gone, the brother had gone to collect the taxes from the Zamandari estate. And the whole day, these two would be in the house or in the garden or on the boat together. So 11 and 12 year olds in the garden, enjoying the beautiful uh, you know, scenes of nature, the beautiful images he constantly has of light, uh, the music that he hears of the folk music. And from that, he starts writing his poetry. And of course, his first audience is his sister-in-law. Because she's and, and I think, Yeah, I think in one of the books, it is said that she tells him, and he reads the poetry to her. She tells him, Ruby, you can do much better than this. This is yeah, not yeah, poetry, yeah. she tells him. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it's in Gangopadhyay's book on him. Yes, That's yes. In first night, yeah, it's there. So I think uh, I just then started imagining uh, that I wanted to write something about this. I didn't know what form it would take. I didn't know it would definitely be a play at that point of time. And what I did, Sutapa, was I just started pulling together lines and scenes from Tagore's own writings. Okay. So 80% of the dialogue in this play, the, the speech, I can't say dialogue because a lot of it is sung. Some of it is recited, uh, is written by Tagore himself. And 20% is written by me. OK, and then even to conceive it as a production on stage, I said, I'll have recourse to Ravindra Sangeet. And, you know, as young people, we don't much like it because all our friends are boring us at parties with those three, four songs. And of course, Bengalis, it's wonderful. You all know over a hundred songs and every Bengali knows them. And they all have that Granthavali with them to sing. And it's all dog-eared and the favorites are all uh, marked out in them. But I got I got my cast members, some of whom were Bengali, to sing some of it to me. And I said, let's remove this dreadful uh, harmonium violin accompaniment and let's use it a cappella, unaccompanied voices. And the singing in my play, I must say it myself, is ethereal. Uh, it's That's a cast of just eight people, three of whom are the leads. Uh, it's just Kadambari, Ravindranath, very young, played by my son, in fact, by Arman. And oh. um, Jyotirindranath, these three characters. And then there are five chorus members who narrate and take, I think the chorus does over 50% of the play. And they sing, they narrate, and often I've used the song. And over it, I've overlaid some very different poem of Tagore's, not a translation of that same thing. 
So okay. people who still say it's a verbal poem because you've used the period, the setting, the costumes, the beautiful Bengali saris, the men all in their white dhotis and kurtas uh, and their shawls. And uh, it's a very different experience on the stage. And uh, I think personally, because I've written another book on Tagore uh, for, for school kids to use in school with activities, I think he would have been very happy with what I'd done with his stuff. I am <laughs> so sure. I'm so sure. You should consider uh, staging it in Shantiniketan itself because Shantiniketan is very, very you know, yeah, you know that, that actually there is so much silence around the story because my play ends with the point where when the family gets him married at the age of 20, uh, within four months, she commits suicide. And of course, now I know that film has been made. Uh, I wish it was a better film personally. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, with Konkana playing the role because Konkana is way too old to play the very young Kadambari, you know, vivacious. She dies at what, at 21? She dies yeah. at 21, very maybe two yes. she yes. yes. And very little acceptance by that family. As a family, you know, were the trailblazers for this book, English. Uh, they wrote books themselves. The women were very accomplished. And she didn't come from that kind of a background at all. So she was always ill at ease. And everybody was a big chamcha of Jyotirindra Nath in any case, you know, mm. and his flamboyant outward kind of personality. So somewhere along the way, this muse of Tagore's, uh, because he became more and more famous, there's a beautiful scene at the end of Act One where he starts getting the letters and he sits with her on the floor of the stage and he puts out like a hundred letters from fans. And he's 18, 19, you know what I mean? And we know what fame does to anybody. Uh, it's heady. The young person mm -hmm. is very in that kind of way. And she withdraws from him. Uh, uh, physically on the stage, she withdraws from him. And there's a very beautiful song. I can't remember what it is in Bangla. Uh, again, a Tagore song about what she is going through. Uh, as she sees this man, uh, I can't say slipping from her grasp uh, because there's no sense of, uh, there's a tremendous closeness. I don't think there's a there's an element of eroticism there at all. But there's a tremendous kindred spirit, a close companionship, uh, a very close feeling. And he notices this through act two. As his world expands, her world, world kind, kind of way contracts because she comes back to the family mansion in Kolkata. So act two is in Kolkata, Jora Shaku and what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so maybe, uh, uh, so maybe he no, yeah. so he no uh, longer yeah. remained her poet. He became the poet of the world. That is where he felt that disharmony. Absolutely. As you see, perhaps in the first play that I did and my father did when he came to Delhi, uh, Mohan Rakesh's Ashar Ka Ek Din, where the mm. story is with the poet Kalidas, who was mm. one thing when he's in the village with his muse Malika, and mm. then he moved to the capital, and Malika mm. and all those places which have inspired Meghdoot and Kumara Sambhav and uh, Shakuntal and all those have gone and mm. married to the princess to Priyangu Manjali and mm. then when they come back to the village to find out what about his background and where did this great poet come from uh, mm. he doesn't even have it in her to come and visit to see her because he feels he's just betrayed her in a way till he comes back in act three years later when he's left the court and feels all that running after fame uh, means nothing. And I think that's again a very telling story of uh, the same story where the muse is ignored and a man has gone in search of making his own uh, fortunes, perhaps on a bigger canvas uh, in another kind of an area. Yeah. But as a, on a personal note for myself, uh, the muse has just walked into the room, uh, my wife, and okay. uh, very much, very, very many years. Yeah, so when I wrote Noor, I was quite clear that it was only her who could play the part. When I wrote Quiet Desire, I needed, of course, a much, much younger actress uh, to essay the role, though she's much older than uh, the actual Kadambari at that time. But I think she brings an innocence and a freshness, and she's Bengali, so that helps on the stage. Lovely, lovely. We've been uh, very lucky to listen to both of you and such a different range of biographies, actually. And though biographies do focus on a specific personality or person, but the ambience of the time period also comes through. Like, uh, Faisal, the Bombay that you have described, you know, the independence era Bombay, oh, it's a feast for the senses, actually. And Thank similarly, you. Manbina, 
your book is about the osho movement you know which actually was a very very important part of the social fabric in the 70s you know india in the 70s yes. i remember i was a young girl and you know my friends and i were very attracted by all those ideas that were going around but it also shows your book also shows that how a one man's dream of a utopian cult in good faith can also go wrong so uh, biographical writings bring all these time periods alive to us they also tell us what could be the reason for certain events that happened for example you know uh, there was so much controversy about padmavati's uh, johar but in my book i have given reasons why she decided to commit johar you know which was quite relevant then unacceptable now Mm -hmm. Similarly, I think have, I have given causes about Nadir Shah's decision to for the Delhi massacre. Mm -hmm. So, you know, biographies help us to understand what happened in the past and why maybe it should not happen in the present, or we can learn lessons from it. So, the maxim is correct. We have to understand to understand the present. We need to study the past. Mm -hmm. So now I think our time is up, and we are ready for uh, audience questions. So, yes, I can see that we have one question. So that is for Faisal, I think. Why is Tanjir <laughs> hardly have plays brought out at Pune? Yeah. Pune yeah. Is asking. I think that's a beautiful question that's being asked, and uh, you know, it's only in recent years where you know most of my actors were part-time actors, as all Marathi theatre and so much of Marathi theatre and Hindi and English theatre is. It's largely an amateur movement uh, that we have here. Uh, we'd love to bring, and I think now we've started travelling in the last three years, and then. You know, once I said I was traveling, we were swamped. So Hyderabad, uh, Simla, Ranchi, Kolkata, uh, Bangalore, Chennai, Goa, we were flooded with uh, offers to bring things there. But certainly Bombay Pune is next on a circuit. I brought plays many, many years ago, four of my productions. But carrying a play uh, is an expensive venture. Uh, Bombay and Pune, unfortunately, are expensive venues. So whoever's out there asking that question, or there, uh, find us some money, very minimal money. We are very happy to travel on at our own expense and stay there. But somebody locally to take charge of hosting the play, and uh, you know, just seeing that audiences are attracted to it. I was so worried when I went to Bangalore, uh, Sutapa, but it was great. The person who I just gone to a festival with quiet desire, and he said, "You bring your plays on your own steam. This theater only costs you five thousand rupees a night." A theater in okay. Delhi costs you sixty thousand rupees a night. That's My the God. difference. Okay, so at five thousand rupees a night, and you can do a matinee and an evening show because I'm there always on the weekends, and it's because they do a play every weekend for the last twenty odd years because of Arundhati's push of that theater movement. Uh, I run uh, three quarters full on every single show, wow. and I take two plays at a time. So Saturday, I'm three quarters full matinee evening. Uh, the last play we did got a standing ovation uh, from the audience. So it's interesting to see. Actually, uh, that's the reality, and we'd love to come to Pune. We are all set. Our bags are packed. Once we've got vaccinated, mm -hmm. there, get in touch with me. Just send me a message. Find how to get in touch with me, and uh, we're happy to come. And my request is Kolkata and Shanti Niketan. I was there with one of my plays this year and two years ago with three of my plays. Yeah, very well Lovely. received. Because yeah. Bengal has such a great uh, theatre going audience. Yeah, so we love theatre. <laughs> yes, yes. So there's one more question which has come in. Uh, okay. Yeah, any writing, biography or otherwise, including academic work, how can it be neutral, unbiased, without some personal inputs of the writer and creator? I think it's a perfect question for Manbina. Bipin, Bipin Chandra Chogle, okay. <laughs> so Mr. Chogle has given this question. Mandina? Yeah, I, I feel you have to, um, um, I believe that one very important factor while writing is a bi uh, biography is to stay unbiased because it is very natural for the writer to feel sympathy for the protagonist or to identify with the protagonist but it is very important that we stay apart and see it as a third person's point of view and um, i think that is the um, uh, that's what i did while i was writing this biography i tried to I, even though um, uh, you know i have a, i 
I, I developed a personal relationship with her and I developed this, um, uh, you know, um, a, a wonderful um, a relationship that, uh, you know, we exchanged a lot of things and there was a lot of warmth. But I tried to stay as unbiased as possible. And that is one thing that comes across from every reader says that you've tried to stay and unbiased and put things as they are in front of the readers. So make your own judgments and make your own conclusions. I will stay out of it. I'm giving you the story from the from the person who has experienced it and, and it's for you to conclude and to judge and make your judgment so um i i stay out of it so i think it's a, it is something you have to practice and uh, keep stay very mindful of because it is very easy to get identified and to become biased lovely thank you so much manvina thank you uh Bezel. thank you manvina for being on this uh, panel i think it has been a very very riveting and interesting panel. Thank you, uh, Pune International Literary Festival. And thank you, the audience. Thank you very much. Please thank take care. So Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this interesting and inf insightful session. Next up, we have Femme Power, behind the scenes and screens after a very short break. Join us at 12.30 p.m. for the same.